The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. We're in a study on the New Covenant. Uh, and uh, chapter Hebrews 8, 9, and 10 are primary lessons. And <clears throat> we learned that... Uh, Verses 23 through 28, it is, consists of three Greek sentences. And there's a lot of key new covenant doctrines in the, these verses. And so I've, uh, I've d originally didn't intend to do that this way, but there's so much information. I, I, so I thought I would study it by the three Greek sentences. And so we're down to 27, 28, and they're really loaded. <laughs> so I can't. I'm going to do verse 27 tonight, and then next time we'll do 28. And um, if you have your Bibles, uh, let me take a read in that. I got to talk and didn't look up my own. 927. And inasmuch as, which is going to be a key phrase, it is appointed... And you'll see that we're talking about divinely decreed, this word appointed, divinely, inasmuch as it is divinely decreed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. And then, of course, verse 28, as part of that sentence, so Christ also having been offered once, see the key word once in both verses, once, that's, that's a key once to bear the sins of many shall appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin. Isn't that interesting? Sin has been absolutely taken out of the equation when he died on that cross. That's pretty amazing. We live in the day in which sin is a done deal as far as the price paid for it, the offering. He was our sacrifice for sin once, once for all time. So this is, a, this is a really key passage, verse 27 to 28, and one of the key words in there is once, is a key passage. So tonight we're going to talk about the appointment or the divine decree uh, with judgment, uh, death and judgment as declared here. And uh, I mean, there is a lot of discussion here. I mean, I'm going to do one study, but there's, there's a lot of discussion here for us. Let's uh, open with a word of prayer and then we'll get into our subject, appointment with death and judgment. Uh, classroom etiquette is that you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit or under his ministry uh, during the teaching hour. He is the great teacher of the word of God. He's called the spirit of truth in John at, at 14, 15, 16. You can't study the Bible in carnality. It's a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. You can't get it in carnality, but you can get it in spirituality. And when you do, then the Holy Spirit is able, as the spirit of truth is able to interpret spiritual truth in your life. Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. That's the responsibility of the Holy Spirit when the scriptures are clear, clearly taught. He's able to manifest that in our life uh, through the exercise of inhale, exhale, uh, like in 2 Timothy 3.16. What a wonderful principle it is. The thing that hindered that in carnality, you say, well, how do I know if I'm in carnality? Well, personal sin would be evidence in your life, both by your conscience and by conviction of the Holy Spirit. And then it becomes your responsibility to confess it according to 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sin, sins, he's uh, faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I give you that moment of priesthood exercise to confess that sin when necessary. Be sure of the Holy Spirit and pray the Holy Spirit would teach you truth because truth sets you free from the cosmic system of lies. And uh, it's the only way you'll get it. Replace the, tr the lie with the truth and then, you've, then you're on the road of uh, divine production. Our Father, we're thankful tonight for these that have come our way both by the automobile and the internet to study with us. 
I pray those who have dropped in us the first time on Tuesday night would stay with us for a year. They will find the momentum of the word of God through inhale, exhale of 2 Timothy 3.16 to work in their life in the most powerful way. I would encourage that to those who are listening by the internet. And if they're within a 40-mile radius of Birmingham, come on and be with us because the Bible in Hebrews 10.25 says, Do not forsake the assembling of gather." And if it's possible to be here on Tuesday or Wednesday or Sunday and you don't have a church home, this would be the place to be. Uh, not just because we teach the word of God, but because there are spiritual mature people here that would like to fellowship and exercise their spiritual gifted ministry to you. I pray, Father, tonight the Holy Spirit would speak to us in a way that we could speak to the world, the unsaved, because they're are two things certain, death and judgment. I know the comedians come along and they say, as certain as taxes, but there's something more certain than that, and that's sin and judgment. It's been appointed unto all men to die, and after that, the judgment. And the only solution to that problem of sin judgment that sin, death, judgment is the gospel of Jesus Christ. For we've prayed it in his name. Amen. <clears throat> well, today we're looking at this idea in as much as is appointed for men to die once. And after this comes judgment. I've got, I've got four ideas tonight. Four, four points. On this appointment, uh, notice under point one, it has been divinely decreed. This word appointed carries the doctrinal concept of uh, divine decrees. Around here, you're familiar with that concept. These are the things that are operational in every dispensation or, or every age, a biblical age. We call it dispensations of every biblical age there is a set of divine decrees that operate specifically for that. Now, under the old covenant, you had, under the old covenant, you had two. You had uh, the Gentile age and the Jewish age. Under the new covenant, you have the church age and the millennial age. They all have sets of divine decrees. And some of these divine decrees, like in divine institutional structure, are for the life of the human race. They're, they, they cover all of human history. And while there are divine decrees that are established, like the creation is under a set of divine decrees. And so these laws are just, you know, they work under a set. They're not oriented to ages or time in biblical history. But there are in, in specific, those who have carried out responsibilities in the Gentile age, there was a set of decrees and the Jewish age, there's a set of decrees and in the church age, there's a set of degrees. We're under, we're under the teachings of Jesus Christ. We're under grace and all of those type of principles, and this is important for us. Uh, and so that word appointed uh, carries that concept. Notice underneath this verse, well, I, let me say that point number one has been finally decreed or appointed that every member of the human race will die and be judged because of Adam's original sin. And where did death come from? Roman, Romans 5.12 tells us it came from Genesis 2.17. Or we could say Genesis 2.17 is what establishes it for the rest of the Bible. Uh, and that's true. Genesis 2.17, that was don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for in the day you eat, dying, you will die, in the Hebrew text. And so Genesis 2.17 establishes the principle. You say, well, I know everybody dies, but what's the cause? And people say, well, they had a heart attack. No, I mean the cause. Well, they say, well, it was a car accident. No, I mean the cause. Yeah, right? I mean, where did death come from? Not, the, not, not what the event was that he died. Well, he had a heart attack. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the cause of death. Where did death come from? Nobody can answer that. There's no medical uh, place in the whole world that could answer that apart from scriptures. 
I mean, they never deal with the cause of death. They always, they always deal with the symptom of it. They'll say he died from a heart attack, died from an automobile accident, he got shot, he, this or that. No, that's not the cause of it. That's the best the world understands about death, and they don't understand any about, anything about it when that's all they understand about it. Did I just confuse anybody other than myself? <laughs> all right. I mean, what is the cause of death? You know, I've used that. I have a lot of people on my side of the family that are in the medical field. I don't know why we all had a desire to go there. <laughs> but, uh, we all seem to have it. A, a, and so they're all over the, all over the different fields of medicine. Um, my sister and her family and my family. But anyhow, and I've used that as a great witnessing tool within my family because they're all... They're all about health and living and trying to prevent death as best they can in the medical world, which is honorable. <clears throat> they don't know where death comes from. And so I use that concept. I've used it to witness to all my people. Um, I'd say, they say, well, I lost a patient. I feel so bad. And then they all talk about how they lost it. And I said, yeah, but. Where does death come from? And, and where does it go? See, don't, nobody, everybody thinks that when death comes and goes, that's all there is to it. But that's not true because the Bible says that's not true. The Bible says, and then judgment. There is life after death, even for the unbeliever. Right? And this text tells us that. <clears throat> And that's the message. That's the wonderful message of the Christian church. We have answers to these things. I mean, complete answers, not why did he die from a heart attack? Why did he die? Where did death come from? And therefore, the source of it is how we know how to conquer it. And that was the whole purpose of Jesus, according to this passage, is the primary reason for Jesus Christ to come into the world and to die on a cross. To resolve that problem. If death is resolved, then judgment's resolved. If death is not resolved, then judgment awaits you. Do you understand that? Th th listen, if you understand that and have scripture to back it up, you're ahead, you're ahead of the entire world and most of the Christian church who does not understand this. They mourn over the cause of physical death and don't mourn over the cause of spiritual death. When that sunk into my head as a young theology student, I went down to Jimmy Hale Mission as a project. I had a good friend, John Ames, who was in the funeral business. And I took a casket. I got a casket. When I had to pull my tour down at, Jimmy, at the Jimmy Hill Mission, I got a casket. And he brought it up in a hearse, parked it out front. And, and we did a Paul Bear thing and brought it in and put it in the service right down in front. And boy, I mean, I had their attention. And <laughs> what we did is we put a mirror in it. In the bottom, we put a mirror. And I, my whole message was about the funeral we were going to do. And I said, everybody knows them, everybody. I don't care who you are. If you walked off the street today, you would know the man in the casket. I preach this sermon that I'm preaching here, but I preach it a little different because, you know, I'm teaching students here, not worldly people, students of the Word of God. So they, when I got through teaching them about sin, death, and judgment, I said, I'm going to have a little, and I had a little funeral, I had a little funeral message for him. Paul, two Paul bears standing at each end, opened a casket. There are two friends of mine who went, went to seminary with me, uh, opened a casket. I told them to row up, get out of the pews, stand up here, and let's show respect. Well, they, they came through. They looked down there, and all they could see was themselves. And they would look back up at me, 
And I would say to him, you know that person? They go like, yes, sir. I know him. <laughs> and he would walk away shaking his head. And, and I would tell him, go back and be seated. We're not through. And so every guy went through there, and they'd look down there, and they'd look up at me, and they'd look down there, and they'd look up at me. And I'd go like, do you know that man? I said it to every person. Every person wanted to know what in the fat's coming off here. I said it to every man. We had a large group. They all went back and sat down. Then I gave an invitation for salvation. Well, that's the truth. I mean, this is the truth of this message. This is the message the world does not understand. Then John Ames, we took the ball bearers, they rolled it out. Nobody could leave until the casket had left. And John Ames drove it back to his place. God bless people like that. The guy who owned a funeral home allowed me to do that. I mean, sometimes you have to be bold as a lion. Do you know that? I don't know if I was as bold as I was stupid at that age, but <clears throat> uh, we did do that. And, uh, and I'm sure it had an impact on those who looked in that casket. And then I explained it to him. And uh, the truth of the message, Christ can change that person. One day you'll be in that casket, but the rest of you will be in heaven. Wouldn't you like that? I, I would tell you. It's appointed, the scripture says in 927. It says, it is appointed, apokimai. It's a present passive indicative. It's been appointed. It stays appointed. This began in the Garden of Eden. And we'll go to the end of human history. That's the present tense. The passive voice is this has been passed on. Romans 5, 12. Wherefore, wherefore is by uh, one man sin entered the world and death by sin. And so death has been spread unto all man. Romans 5, 12. That's what this means. That's the passive voice. The passive voice. This thing's passed on. It's not a choice. It's been decreed. This is the way it is. How come? How come I get punished for what Adam did? Well, the, you know, look, you, you focused on the wrong thing. I mean, because it was decreed. Here's what you ought to focus on. How's I, how can I get out from under that? It's the last Adam that came in to, get, came to rescue you, to save you, to rescue you, to deliver you from the bondage of sin, death, and judgment. That's, I mean, focus on the positive. It's been appointed for men. Notice that's anthropos. That's mankind. Anthropos. It's been appointed for men, notice there's a definite article with the word men, mankind, to die, aorist active infinitive, to die, that's the appointment, to die, the, it's connected with the main verb, this is an infinitive, working off the main verb, appointed to die once, and after this, that infinitive is still working with that main verb, once, and after this, the word comes is not there. It ought to be italics in your Bible, is it? The word come? Comes? That's in italics. It's not there in original. It's been given to help you understand. And then judgment. Listen, it's okay to do that, but it messes it up a little bit because the emphasis in it's been decreed to die once after this judgment. Listen, and I mean that. Listen, when you die without Christ, here's what's going to happen to you. You're going to go to a place called torment. Now, if you think what you're seeing over in Hawaii right now with this lava running, if you think that's bad, that's nothing compared to where you're going. And where you're going, which is described in Luke, the 16th chapter, which is hell, you're going to stay there until you stand before the judgment seat of God, and then you're going to go to a lake of fire where you'll be part of that lava movement. You know, everybody wants to have a movement. There's one. That's a movement. And listen, that's decreed. There is nothing that's going to, nothing can break that decree apart from Jesus died on the cross for your sin to take, if he takes care of your sin, he takes care of the death and he takes care of the judgment. 
If he does not take care of your sin, he does not take care of your death. He does not care, take care of your judgment. But when he dies on that cross and takes, wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men. That's, that's Romans 5.12, which is on your paper. See that? Therefore, just as through one man, Adam, sin entered his world, death through sin. And so death spread to all men. And listen, writer says, and what spreads beyond that is judgment. 1 Corinthians 15, 21, 22 says this is the only solution. The only solution. The only, for since by man Adam came death, by man Christ also came the resurrection from the dead. For in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. And that's it. And that's why we should be evangelical. Listen, I don't care who they are in your family. It, if they die without Christ, they die, uh, they die under Adam's sin, death, judgment. And that's, I don't care who they are. I don't care if they preach in the pulpit. These people need to know you've got to believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day in order to be saved. When you're saved, you're rescued. You're delivered from Adam's sin, death, judgment. Nobody preaches this stuff anymore. Nobody preaches it. I mean, Jesus is one of the good old boys, and you know, this, look, you're under this kind of judgment. Without Christ, you, have, you haven't got a hope over sin, death, and judgment. Not a hope. Or as we used to say, not a dog chance. Now, here's the second thing. Our lesson text opens with a special phrase that must not be neglected because I'm looking at verse 27. Because this phrase, just like a lot of phrases, the conjunctions and things like that, this is a special phrase that's really important. Notice this little phrase in verse 27, and inasmuch as. Now, if you just popped in like tonight and didn't read, hadn't been reading along the whole chapter with us, just walking our way through it, this wouldn't have a bit of meaning to your life, and you would be shocked with what it means. If you just dropped in like some of the people off the Internet tonight, and they just stopped by to see what we were doing, and they read in as much as, they'd skip it because it makes no sense. They would skip it. I promise you they'd skip it. That's what people do when they're not students of the Word of God. They skip stuff. They don't take any responsibility. I mean, if I said there's a $100 bill attached to in as much, we'd all figure out what it was. Well, listen, at some point, you've got to take responsibility for this stuff when you read the Bible. You just don't pass it over because you don't understand it. You don't, pa you don't go on until you do understand it. And so... This special phrase, in as much as, I put it on the paper for you in the Greek language because we have many Greek students here. The special phrase refers back to the answer to Adam's original sin. That whole phrase is to tell you that you ought to rejoice in the answer because you've already learned the answer to verse 27. You already learned it. And here's where you learned it. It was in verse 26. In fact, it's verses 1 through 26. Verses 1 through 20. Verse 15. He's the mediator. This was a big deal. In verse 26, this goes immediately back to 26 when it says, but now, look at this, but now what? Listen to me. I wrote it on your paper. You can read that. Now what? Listen, no, no, look what it says. But now, once. See, you look for key words, right? Verse 26, once. Verse 27, once. Verse 28, once. You look for markers. See, there's carrying off. We got once, once, and once. We got three onces, right? And, and that, that goes like, whoa, whoa. 
Those are markers. And, and they're important to this little phrase, inasmuch as. Inasmuch refers back to the answer to Adam's original sin, sin, death, and judgment. Here's what it says. Listen to me. Here's what it says. Now, once at the consummation of the age. When was that? When Jesus came into the world, completed his mission by going to the cross, right? We put that on the board. We go to the cross. He dies for my son. He's buried. He's raised from the dead the third day. That's the gospel. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Romans 1, 16 says, when you believe that, this gospel here, death, burial, resurrection, is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. That gives you, at that point, that gives you uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself as a gift of God. You know why? Because you live under the new covenant through Jesus Christ. We live in the consummation of the age. The consummation of the age is him coming into human history and doing what he came to do to defeat sin, death, and judgment. Where was the once? At the consummation. Do you see that? And if you, have that, if you have that once, then the once attached to sin, death, and judgment is over. And then the once that deals with the second coming of Christ is a big deal. You right? Because I've got three once's. And they're all important. They're all attached. And they're all attached by this little phrase, in as much as. <laughs> One that you would neglect to look at. And how wonderful it would be if you just pause and let the Holy Spirit go like, look for key words, look for key words. And see how they're attached. So, at the consummation, watch this, at the con once at the consummation of the ages, verse 26, he has been manifested, that's, that's that consummation of the age where he has appeared, that's the incarnation, the story of the incarnation to the crucifixion, burial, and resurrection, that, that's what he's talking about. He has been manifested, watch this, to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He did something the animals couldn't do. He sacrificed himself. They didn't voluntarily do it. He voluntarily did it. That, that's, that's why he fulfills what they couldn't. By the sacrifice of himself. So that by the first coming, Christ also having been offered once to bear the sin of many, in verse 27, at the second coming, this will not be an issue. Sin Death, judgment will not be an issue at the second coming of Christ. He does not come a second time to deal with sin. Right? Comes a second time to deal with Satan. You do know that. Christ appeared in human history the first time, we call it the incarnation, to put away sin. That's the big, that's the, Consummation of the ages business. Paul says in 1 Timothy 1.15, it's trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance, which is this, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I'm foremost of all. I mean, we all feel that way. Especially when you're older and you've been rescued from the sin, death, judgment, know it. It becomes a powerful idea. Also, here are some verses that would be well worth your time. 1 John 2.2, 2, he is the propitiation for the sin of the world. Is that a big one? It ought to be. The propitiation, you know what the propitiation is? To appease the wrath of God over sin, death, and judgment. It's the only way it can be appeased is through Jesus Christ. And listen, I've told you this once before, but when you read John 5, 6 through 21, you pay attention to the key word much more, much 
more. You look for, you look for markers. Read looking for markers. And in that passage, verse 9, 10, 15, 17, 21, 20, and 21, that I can't begin to tell you what a wonderful study that will be to your life. When you hear, listen, when you hear God say much more, you've got a hold of something, right? When you hear God say much more, now when I say much more, who knows what that means? When you say much more, I don't know what that means. But when God says much more, that's got to be lights out big. Would you not think that? When God says something much more, I've, I, my ears perk up. And boy, does he say it. Look, 9, 10, 15, 17, 20, 21. That's a lot of times. <laughs> That's a whole lot of times to say much more. I mean, wouldn't you like to know you're going to get much more in your salary? You're going to get much more this, much more that? We all are interested in the word much more, unless it's found in the Bible, and then we pass it over. Uh, it beats me. I don't know. Point three. That's the kind of words I look for. I write those babies down. I want all I can get from God, you know, if it's volitional. For the unbeliever, his appointment with sin, death, judgment will result in eternal damnation of the lake of fire. There is no way that the average person could ever understand the lake of fire, unless they paid attention. And in fact, I was thinking the other day that I might start recording because they're showing so much of that hot lava moving that I might record some of that on my phone to talk about when I talk about what I mean by, by lake of fire. And, 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 that is overwhelming when you, the human mind, to just see what that can do. And that's nothing compared to lake fire. That's nothing. That's like a swimming pool. But that's a, quite a visual when you see that, that hot lava, lava moving down mountains and stuff. That's amazing what that does. The heat and how it moves. It looks like a river, doesn't it? It's amazing. That's nothing compared to the lake of fire. I mean, you'd have to climb inside that volcano and drop to the deepest part you could drop. I mean, listen, this is what, this is what the Bible is talking about, lake of fire. My goodness. Matthew 25, 41 tells you who the lake of fire was designed for. Listen, God didn't create the lake of fire for you. Now, you may go to it, but that's not who it was designed for. Just like the cross was designed for Jesus Christ, it wasn't designed for anybody. It was designed for him. You can be there. You could participate in it, but that's not. He designed it for Jesus Christ. Lake of Fire was designed. Matthew 25, 41. He will also say to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. You say, well, eternal fire, or how do we know that means the lake of fire? Revelation 20.10 brings it out. The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire. See, that's, that's the, they're talking about the same thing. Uh, where the beast and the false prophets, that's, that's the tribulational guys, are also, and they would be tormented day and night forever and ever. I, how long? Ever. ever. I mean, how, but look, he didn't just say forever. Do you understand what I mean? He, he said forever and ever. Now, I don't know how long that is. But I can tell you, it's longer than I can count. It's longer than I can count. And I'll tell you, when he added the ever, I went, whoa, he's serious. Forever and ever? Man, I don't even get forever. Right? Forever's beyond my scope. But who, whoever gets forever. And then he says forever, forever. I'm going to like. That's a that's got to be a long time. That's got to be a long time. I mean, 
I mean, you don't even get till death do you part on that deal. Right? I mean, forever and ever. There's no, there's no end to that, but ever. There's a, I mean, you know, you, you get married and they go like, well, until death do you part. And you go like, well, I got an out. <laughs> One of us die and get out of this thing. Oh, there's no out on that forever, ever. It's not going to be a picnic like a, a lot of guys that say, well, I'll take my chance. There are no chances. What do you mean you take your chances? That sounds like there's odds here. Right? And I hear guys say that all the time. They go, like, well, well, Pastor, I'll just take my chances. I go like, wait, wait, wait. We, we shooting crap here? What are you talking about? I didn't deal no cards out. Daddy wants a new pair of shoes. I mean, what are you talking about? Uh, or what was you, baby or somebody? I don't know. Somebody needs a pair of shoes. I remember that. I don't know who. I love you, Pastor. I know. I know. And it's not, it's, there's, no, there's no chance to this. It's not a gamble. What do you mean a chance? Your chance is now. You can get saved, buddy. You want to shoot crap? Shoot crap while you're alive. I mean, who's going to shoot a crap and say, well, if you lose, I'm going to shoot you? I mean, who's going to say, don't, I'm not going to pick them things up. Those rocks ain't going to work for me. I'd get snake eyes for sure. As soon as I threw them down, they'd be like, Pfft. I mean, who does that stuff? That's, that's just stupid, isn't it? I'll take my chances. Listen, you're taking your chances talking like that right now. That's dumb. I mean, let me talk to your mama. I don't know, she didn't, who raised you? Your mama didn't raise you. Let me talk to your mama. Spiritual death will become the second spiritual death when an unbeliever physically dies without grace, salvation, and Jesus Christ. S spiritual death will become second spiritual death. Sp second spiritual death. You're spiritually dead in time. Now you'll be spiritually dead in eternity. My, my. Spiritual death is only removed by faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the second spiritual death will never be removed. Because your chances, big guy, your chances are done the moment you died. Take your chances. You're taking your chances to talk, talk that way. Spiritual death is only removed. Second spiritual death is appointed after you physically die. It's appointed after the great white throne judgment. You will get this. That's Revelation, the 20th chapter, 11 through 15. I mean, and you know how I know it'll come? People say, well, pastor, how do you know? Well, I'll tell you because it's been de decreed by God. You know how I know it? I throw that pencil up, it falls down. You know why? It's been decreed of God. This is not brain surgery. This is not something difficult for me. I mean, what are you talking about? You got to watch? Why do you wear a watch if you don't believe in all that time business? You got a watch because you got to be at work at a certain time? No kidding. Are you looking forward to your watch when it says 5 o'clock and I can leave? I guess so. Second spiritual death. If you die physically without the gospel of Jesus, accepting the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead third, he gave you eternal life so you could have a place with God forever and ever and ever and ever. Then you're going to go to the lake of fire in the end. Every unbelieving member of the human race who rejects the gospel of grace, salvation, and Jesus Christ will stand before the great white throne judgment and then be cast into a lake of fire forever and ever. You know, you won't be down there someplace marking days till you can be rescued. You know, and then drawing a line through it and go like, well, there's five. There wouldn't be enough room to mark all the days, for you'll be there forever and ever.
Revelation, the 20th chapter, verse 15 says, and anyone, if anyone's name was not found written in the Lamb's book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. You know what thrown means? They won't, nobody's willfully going to go. Oh, I ain't got that job. I can stay in that job. Here's point four. Now, why am I telling you this? I look over there. I look everywhere. I know all you people. I've known most of you most of our lives. <laughs> Many of you have known since I've been Johnny and Shirley. I was, I was saved in the church they go to. Well, I wasn't saved in that church. I went to, this, went to that church right after I was saved. I've known these people forever. You can tell that we're forever. <laughs> and, and some of you, I taught in college when you were a college student and uh, came with me. What a wonderful journey that's been. What a wonderful journey that's been. The power of the word of God has been proven out in the lives of people that have believed it. The reason I tell you, those of you that are students of the word, I tell you this because your friends need to know this truth. And you have the, need to have the courage one day over a cup of coffee when they're in a, a, a mood, maybe a little piece of pie and a cup of coffee to tell them the absolute truth. And sometimes that can be tough because those kind of people that will sit and have a cup of coffee with may, may push back pretty hard. But listen, somebody has to tell them the truth in, in love. And I'm so thankful for that in my life. I'm thankful that people had the courage to tell me the truth whether I wanted to hear it or not. And this was a message I got from him too. I'm telling you the truth. That's why as a young guy just saved, that's why I, I preach this like absolutely nuts, like I don't, I still do, don't I? I mean, I'm, st I'm still nutty about the gospel of Jesus Christ. I preach it all the time. I preach it all the time because I want you to take carry it to the world. I want you to understand that the people you work with, the people in your family, the people of your friends, they need the message of the gospel. If you really love these people, you don't want to see them go to the lake of fire. You don't want to see that. And listen, it's not your job to save them. It's your job to tell them, isn't it? You don't have to save nobody. Jesus Christ is the Savior. He never called me the Savior. <laughs> yeah? I don't want my words in anywhere. No, you don't, do you? Not, 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 not one. Jesus didn't. No, we don't. But I don't know how much we spend time with our worst enemies, but we spend a lot of time with our best friends. Because of grace, salvation, point four, everyone who believes that Jesus died for his sins, was buried and raised on the third day, has a different appointment with, with death and judgment. Because, listen, sin's been taken care of. Then if that's true, then death and judgment has been taken care of. So that's not what I'm going to experience. I'm going to stand for, before the judgment seat of Christ. It's not going to be a sin issue. You know, I used to hear people say, well, a screen is going to come down and your sins and all that. I mean, how's that? But listen, the screen came down. It was right here. It was called the cross, the burial and the resurrection. That yeah, screen coming across nothing. Not for the believer. Because of grace, salvation, everyone who believes that Jesus died for his sins was buried and raised on the third day, which is the gospel, has a different appointment with death and judgment. The believer's appointment with death and judgment is entirely different. He will stand before the judgment seat of Christ in Romans 10, 4 and 2 Corinthians 5, 10. 
not because of sin. He stands there because sin's been taken out of the element. When sin was removed, death and judgment for sin was removed with it. He will receive. Why, why does he stand before the judgment seat of Christ? To get rewards, eternal rewards and crowns and a life fit for the new heavens and earth. That's why he's there. It's a promotion day. That's why, that's why around here when a person dies, we call it promotion. And we celebrate. We celebrate. There's more to celebrate over a believer's death than there is over a believer's marriage. Not that they're not both important, but there ought to be that same concept. Death for a believer is a celebration. It, he's been promoted. And listen, he's been promoted, and his whole life will be one of promotion because of the grace of God. It's because of grace, not because of works, because of grace. And once you know that, once you know your rewards is based on grace and not works, then your rewards are going to be, they're going to be so many that you're going to be shocked when you get there. You can read about the rewards in 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15. You can read about crowns in James 1, 12, 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8, 1 Peter 5, 4, 1 Thessalonians 2, 19, and Philippians 4, 1 through 3, where they talk about crowns. And these are all really important to our life after death and the ages to come. These are all important. Your rewards, your crowns, your life fit for the new heaven and new earth. Revelation 21, 22. And then a great discussion out of Peter in 2 Peter 3rd chapter 5 through 13. Well worth your discussion. Well worth your read. In 2 Peter 3, 13, in closing, but according to his promise, listen to that. I mean, you should pay more attention to promise. You should pay attention to promise. You, and listen, every time you see the word promise from God, what God promises you, you need to know this verse because you should attach it with every time you hear a promise from God, you should attach Romans 4.21 because that tells you that what he's promised, he is able to bring it into fulfillment. And sometimes... It doesn't come fast enough for you, but it still will come because it'll come in his timing, not yours. It will come. What he's promised, he will do. He is able to do and he will do in his timing. His time is always perfect for when you get it. But according to his promise, we are looking. You know, a Sunday I dealt with Mary on a Mother's Day special. And Simeon came along, and Simeon was looking for the consolation of Israel. You know what that was? That's the consummation of the age. He was looking for the coming of the Messiah to fulfill his, God's promise to, the, to, the Isra, to Israel. Uh, he was looking for Christ to come and bring this whole thing into a whole new age of new covenant thinking. And Anna, you know, she was looking for the redemption of Israel. They were both looking for the first coming of Christ. Do you know what we are? Peter says we should be those people looking for his second coming. And we are, aren't we? I mean, if you grow in the word of God, you, I mean, listen, when you do the Eucharist, one of the most meaningful words in the Eucharist, other than the, the cup and the element, is the word. Proclaim his death until he comes. I mean, that sets my feet on responsibility. It sets my feet to be responsible to the community, to the state, to the nation, and to the world of the message of the word of God and the gospel. I'm reminded when I take part in the Eucharist that I should be looking for his coming. And when his coming comes, it's going to be we're into short time. Now was the time of grace. Now was the time when people can easily come into the kingdom. 
easily come into the kingdom. And we have this great opportunity and responsibility to share the gospel with everybody. And, and listen, you know what's interesting? If you'll walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, he'll teach you the most phenomenal ways to share Christ with people. It is amazing to me. I mean, I'm ready to pull the trigger anytime. But sometimes I just don't know how to introduce it. So I don't even worry about it anymore. I just walk in the power of the Spirit and know that when I get that opportunity, when that little door opens, I was standing in line at Chick-fil-A today. I'm going to close with it. I was standing in the line at Chick-fil-A today, early in the morning. They weren't really busy. So, the, you know, there was two people in the line. One guy was up front. And uh, then there was a, a young black man, uh, and he had a Huffman shirt on. And uh, so I, I, and he was standing right, right behind, behind me. And so I turned and g gathered a conversation with him. And we talked about, I say, uh, from Huffman, mm -hmm, go to school there. It was early enough for, you know, for him to get there to go to school. And he was, he was a senior and a uh, ball player. And so w we engaged in, in all of that. And he said, uh, I said, what you going to do when you uh, graduate? What, 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 what you got? You got something on your plate looking forward to? He said, yes, sir. I'm going to join the Army. I'm already signed up as soon as I graduate. Uh, I go, I go, I'm going into Army. And he told me what, what field he was selected to get into and accepted. I forget what it was now. And I said, man, you're making my day. Talk to me. And uh, I said, you got any other plans? He said, yes, sir. Um, I'm going in. I'm going to pull my hit, hitch, and hopefully I am. I'm going to be able to get out of there uh, in my time, and uh, I'm going to UAB. I'm going to the military to serve my time. I am thankful that I live in America. I'm going to serve. I mean, who hears this anymore? I'm, I live in America. I'm going to serve my country. And when I get out, I'm going to take the scholarshiping. I'm going to UAB, and he told me what he was going to be and what his aspirations in life was. And I said to him, boy, am I proud of you today. And so I told the guy when I got to the thing, I said, this one's on me. Young man, this, this deal here is on me. I am proud of you. I can't begin to tell you how proud I am of you. And uh, so the one man in front of me uh, overheard this conversation. You know, you don't pay attention to people listening. And so we had this big conversation, and, and this kid was trying to get out of there to go to the thing. And so I, I couldn't get any more from him. I couldn't get any more because he was moving on, getting his stuff, and I was going to pay for it, and he was out of the door to finish, go to school. But the guy standing in front of me, listening to this conversation, I noticed he wasn't moving, and there was hardly nobody there. I couldn't figure, but I didn't pay any attention because I was engaged, hoping I could get to where I was wanting to go. And the man in front of me, the young guy, I said, listen, go on. I got it. Go, go on. Go ahead of me. Go on. And this guy said, yeah, go ahead of me too. Uh, and so he goes on and gets a sandwich. I tell the guy there, the kids there know me. I said, you know, put that in mind. And uh, so this guy, he goes like, he's standing. He's not going where they go like, sir, come on. And he goes like, yeah, I'll be there in a minute. And uh, he says, have you ever heard anything like that before? And I went, no. And, I, and he said, uh, I was just so impressed with that young man. I would, I know, I know, I'm, I, I, you just don't see that anymore. I said, when I was younger, I see this all the time. I, I very seldom see that. And he said, he was such a, uh, uh, just a good kid. And I went, yeah. I said, but you know, the, the worst part of that, I wanted to talk about Jesus Christ. I didn't have a chance to because I knew we were all in a bind. I was so uh, caught up in his aspirations in life that I missed that opportunity and then I and then like as soon as I said it but like a bell went off of me I went oh wait <laughs> I got a nibble here <laughs> I got a nibble and so I was I was and we both moved up to the line together in this deep conversation about Jesus Christ and I had the greatest time of witnessing to that guy and he said he said to me, he shook my hand. He said, this has been quite a morning. He said, I'm really going to think. I said, well, listen, don't think too long about this. Listen, 
Listen, when you get in that car and turn that engine on, you can believe. If you don't want to do it now, that's okay. But listen, you believe it and you got it. You believe you receive. Don't, re don't forget that. When you believe you receive. And he went, uh, uh, that's really good. So I told the kid, I said, put that one on me too. And uh, the little kid started getting worried whether he'd get the money. <laughs> that's serious. And when I got up there, he went, they call me Mr. Rod. They say, Mr. Rod, you sure you can handle this? I can, I can help you. <laughs> and and I, wasn't that cute? I said, no, nah, I like it. The Lord takes care of me every once in a while. And I, I got that. But it, what a great morning. And it just, you know, who knows? Falls in your lap. Just, right? You know, just because you you want to do this. I, I want to do this. I want to help people. I want to share Christ. I, I want to encourage young people. And God just has all kinds of people like that. If we're, we're ready to open a conversation up in it. And I know you do it too. I mean, I, I just, I, I know what I'm doing. I don't know what you're doing. Okay, but opportunities around us every day, just multitude of opportunities. And I know you take advantage of it, and this is the things that people need to hear. Sometimes people just need to have us pray with them. Do you know that? They'll say, man, I've got such a thing. I'll say, well, let, let's just pray. Let me just pray with you. Uh, and sometimes that's all you can get, stand in line. And it's amazing how people will share stuff with you, just stand in a line talking and they just thought oh, I was just burdened well let's pray father I'm thankful today for this this time together with these people and those on the internet I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth to our souls this is an absolute truth sin comes from Adam's sin is 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 passed on Romans 5 12 is passed on into death and death is passed on into judgment and it, and, and that's been decreed by God but it doesn't have to be. You don't have to experience that because Christ came into the world, died on a cross, was buried in a race. And this is our generation of people. And if you hear my voice, you need to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. It will absolutely, the moment you believe, the sin will be removed, the death will be removed, and the judgment will, will be removed. That's the story of 1 John 2.2. 2. That's the story of Romans 5, 12 through 21. You need to believe that. You need that, believe that, and be delivered by the grace of God through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us.